Ephesians chapter number six, and uh, we're talking about uh, the concept of service, and we were talking about service uh, last week. What does it mean uh, to serve? And uh, and so often we get to the the activity of service and uh, how do I serve? That it's important that we make sure we get to the starting place of first of all who I serve. Who I serve, and we're going to talk about that in, uh, in Ephesians chapter number six, and how practical it is. I love how practical it is. This kind of goes along with this with this morning's message a little bit. Sometimes we think acts of faith are great acts, but acts of faith are simply obedient acts, and uh, and so very practical in Ephesians. These are verses that you're very very familiar with. Ephesians chapter six, verse number one: Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of, of your heart, as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters do the same thing unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is heaven, neither is there respect of any persons with him. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then, of course, it goes in to put on the whole armor of God. And so this very familiar verses, and it, and it gives application from children to parents to servants. And it, it, it circled around all this is the idea of when you serve, even when you're serving people, ultimately your service is unto Christ. Okay? Your service is unto Christ, and so it tells us that in the verse, verse number six, not with eye service uh, as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Okay? And so you think, okay, I want to do that. How do I do that? How do I make sure? Because it's very easy to get into the rut of things. It's very easy just to simply get into the culture. It's very easy to not do something uh, as unto the Lord, but do it as unto men or for your own glory or for your own self. And so we need to ask, how do, I, how do I make sure that I'm serving the Lord? Okay, And it goes from children, when you're obeying your parents, serve the Lord. Okay, When it goes to, to fathers, when you're caring and, and raising your children and not provoking them to wrath, as unto the Lord. Servants, and then this word servant here, it goes kind of attaches to the end of verse number 8. Whether you be bond or free. And so the idea here is this concept of even a bond servant, okay? Just to take a quick time out so we can go over this real briefly. This concept of servant really was the idea of slave, okay? Slave. And you're going to hear sometimes on the news or someplace that uh, those religious people, uh, the, the Bible condones slavery. The Bible condones slavery. Uh, the, and it's important that we give a good definition, Okay, we give a good definition because there are different types of slavery. There is criminal slavery, which we call the penal system, right? We still, even our Constitution condones criminal slavery. Okay, you break the law, you lose your freedom. Okay? There's also something called the concept of conquering slavery. We fight, I win, I get all the stuff. But we think about it after after World War One, after World War Two, who got to set all the rules, who got to set all the parameters, and who got to, to determine how things were going to be done. And even the Americans, uh, we set up bases in Japan, we set up bases in Germany, though we had a lot of freedom and liberty that we gave because that ultimate goal was for people to stand on their own two feet. We still set the parameters because we want. Okay, and so you go back to that time, and if there was a a, a battle that took place. Whoever won got all the spoils. And so you do see in the Bible criminal slavery, and you do see in the Bible conquering slavery. What you do not see condoned in the Bible is channel slavery. 
Channel slavery is the innate superiority of one person over another because of some uh, race or because of some, uh, you know, descendancy or even the, the concept of, of a caste system. You're not going to see that. And we'll even see in here that God is not a respecter of person. There is no caste system within Christianity. Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay. So there is no condoning of channel slavery within, within Scripture. Okay? And so even that idea, sometimes we, we, we think the idea of that God made certain uh, people innately superior over others. Listen, we believe that God made man and made woman in his own image. Man fell, but any man, any woman can receive the redemption of Christ. Amen. And they are equal before God, and they were equally guilty, and they can be equally saved. Praise the Lord. And so there is no place in Scripture when you see the, the condoning of channel slavery or the innate superiority or the, um, the nature superiority of one race or one uh, people uh, group over another people group. So you don't have to be queasy when you see in Scripture, ah, uh, slavery. Okay? You don't have to be that way because there is no sense of that God puts some people a greater than others. Hey, that's not the way in anywhere in Scripture. We'll even see that God is not a respecter of persons. With that being said, it's so important that Christians understand that. That there is no superiority of one race. And there is no superiority of one gender over the other. Listen, we are equal before God. Now, we don't have to stay equal. Okay? We can obey and pursue and grow. Or we can destroy our life. But Christians of all people should be the least filled with bigotry, and the least filled with racists, because we're all equally guilty or redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Doesn't matter your skin, doesn't matter your heritage, doesn't matter your family, and of all people, we should be the ones that should be encouraging and pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, So that has nothing to do with the method, message. I just want to tell you this word, when you see servant, has the, uh, the idea, the concept of slavery, and that doesn't have to scare you because the Bible does not condone uh, slavery. I was uh, talking to some people not too long ago, and uh, I said, um, do you think the Bible condones slavery? And they had heard that there was slavery in the Bible, so they're like, yes. I said, so you think God condoned the slavery that existed in America? And they were like, well, he must have if he condoned slavery. I said, no, no, you have a definition problem. Please let me help you, Okay. Because there is no innate superiority. And any person that thinks they're superior based upon their personhood, okay, thinks more highly of themselves than they ought to. Right. Okay? We are equal before God, equally guilty or equally redeemed. And uh, so he says, uh, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. So whether you're in servitude okay, or you're the master, there is the concept of ultimately you are serving the Lord. Yeah, like, but I don't like my circumstances. I don't like my family situation. I don't like these things that are happening. And so God gives us this understanding that we are to be serving as unto the Lord, not for the glorification of ourselves or the admiration of men. We are to be serving. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that if it is easy for pride to step in and me to seek admiration of others or for me to desire to look good in the eyes of people? How do we do this? Well, look what it says in verse number, verse number five. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. In singleness of your heart as unto, uh, unto Christ. This is the idea that my heart can be drawn away to, to pride. My heart can be drawn away to, to, to desire to be enamored with men or to, for men to be enamored with me. And he says, I want you to do this. I want you to have a singleness of heart, a singleness of purpose. I want you to proclaim it. I want you to have purpose in it. As I obey men, I don't do it for their glory or my glory. I do it for the glory of God. Okay, that is something, the idea of singleness is honed in enough so that it can be uh, not only understood, it can be declared. That there is a single purpose. I was, I, every once in a while, I'll watch my kids clean. And unfortunately, my boys learn some of their cleaning habits from me. That's where they learn some of their cleaning habits. And mom will say, hey, I need you to sweep the room. I need you to sweep the room. Okay. And they're not sweeping the room. They're dancing with the broom. That's what they're doing. 
They go to the middle of the room and they're like, oh, there's a piece of trash over there. You know? And they may, you know, sweep up the middle of the room a little bit. And, and they're really excited that they will get some sort of pile. You know, we have tile. You're going to have dirt. And, and they'd get a little bit of a pile. And the, and the evidence of a pile means that they're done. I mean, look, there's evidence. I'm done. And then my wife will come in. And she said, I thought I told you to sweep this room. I did sweep the room. Evidence. But there's a difference in the purpose, the way she sweeps and the way they sweep. They stand in the middle of the room, look for something, and sweep it to themselves. You know what she does? She goes over to the corner. She starts in the corner. And she has this uniform pattern. And she does like two feet, two feet, two feet, two feet. And, and then she goes back and two feet, two feet, two feet. There's not an inch of that floor that is missed with the pattern that she sets down. Because there is a purpose. The purpose is to clean the room, to sweep the room, and she is focused on accomplishing that purpose. Okay? I don't understand why she can't daydream when she's cleaning. Daydream and cleaning is the perfect time to daydream. And so I'm cleaning and I'm like, da, da, da. how can you sweep the floor when you're looking at the ceiling? Because there's, there's a difference in our, in our purpose, our, what we desire to accomplish. Okay? And so that singleness of purpose means that there is a stated uh, concept to accomplish. It's understood. It's, it's clear. And so therefore it is attainable. It is not ethereal and it is not measurable by just some minimal activity. It is, it is understood. This is my purpose. And that concept of singleness of heart means we have to bring back to the realization that my purpose as a young person for obeying my parents is to do it as unto the Lord. My purpose as a father to not provoke my children to wrath is to do it as unto the Lord. My purpose as a servant, uh, as an employee, servant, bond, or free, uh, mutual, or, or whatever the situation is, is to do it as unto the Lord. And my purpose as a master, to understand I also have a master, and so to do it as unto the Lord, it is not only a stated purpose, it is an attainable purpose. And that's something that has to be understood Understood, but what is the difference? Why is it different when they sweep than when she sweeps? Okay? Well, because their purpose is different and there's less of an importance that is put upon the desired accomplishment and all they want to do is finish. Not actually finish, just to be accounted to be finished. In order to be finished, you have to prove that there was some, something that you gathered. Look, I finished, but it wasn't for the purpose of cleaning the room. Their purpose was, well, I've been told what to do. How little can I do to be able to say that I did it? And I don't say that to their ill. I say that to their male nature. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I say it to. <laughs> How little can I do to say that I've accomplished this task so I can move on to another task, okay? Where her purpose is actually legitimately on purpose by choice to clean the room. And so because of that, it is outside of her purpose to skip anything. It's outside of her purpose. That goes contrary to her purpose. To where my young men, if they come into the room and there's a chair or there's a basket. Their goal is to have the appearance of cleanliness. So who wants to move the basket? There's probably dirt under there. Yeah, amen. So who wants to move the basket? That would reveal more work to be done. Because we have a different purpose. We have a completely different purpose. And so when we're talking about singleness of heart... And we wonder why it's so hard to say, to, to say, I want to do this unto the Lord. We have to go back and check. The one that we are serving is the Lord. And there should be a singleness of heart that says, I am doing this. Though it may seem egregious, though it may seem monotonous at times, I'm not doing it simply for the completion of the task or simply because of the authority structure or hierarchical structure that's, that has, has told me to do it. I have a purpose. My purpose is to serve the Lord. Amen. 
But I'm so thankful that in this passage, Luke, who is able to partake in that purpose, children can partake in that purpose. They can partake in that purpose. Fathers can partake in that purpose. Parents can partake in that purpose. Servants can partake in that purpose. Masters can partake in that purpose. That with a singleness of heart, I want to purposely do what I do because I want to please the Lord. I have to continue to chip away at those things that would, like barnacles on a ship, be added to my heart to create a duplicity of purpose to have other values and other desires, the praise of men, the elevation of pride. I constantly have to chip those things away so I have singleness of purpose. I want to please the Lord. I want to please the Lord. What am I going to do tomorrow morning? I want to please the Lord. What am I going to do in that next conversation? I want to please the Lord. What am I going to do in that next confrontation? I'm going to please the Lord. What am I going to do? As Sierra said, the next time I'm confronted with the reality of my own sin or my own wrongdoing, am I going to try to hide it, circumvent it, so nobody knows about it, so I don't look bad at it, so, so people can continue to have a, a picture that I want them to have? Or am I going to realize if I'm going to fulfill and complete my purpose, then thank you, God, for confronting me and helping me to shave away the barnacle on my heart of some other purpose or some other sin because that's contrary to the singleness of my heart. I want to please the Lord. I want to serve the Lord. But I don't know as well. We probably, you can ask Brother Honey because he's a lot better with boats and those sorts of things. But I believe if you don't clean a boat, the fact that it was clean at one time does not mean it's going to remain clean. Especially if it's in use. If it's in use, it's going to get dirty. It's going to need to be scraped and cleaned at some point. Our heart is constantly in use in relationships and activities and, and parent-child and child-parent and servant-master, master-servant, employee-employer and, and all these areas of relationships. Our heart is constantly in use. If we're not coming back and recognizing the singleness of our purpose to say we want to serve the Lord, then our heart is going to collect those barnacles of different purposes or different goals. And pretty soon we do things purely for the sake of pleasing the eye, of being men pleaser, of trying to uh, check a box or making sure that people have the right assumptions about us. We would never want them uh, to assume anything wrong. And so we, we personify something or we picture something when in reality we know our heart is wayward and far from him. And so we have to come back and determine. There's no activity that will determine that your service is unto the Lord. There's no action steps that you can take to say, to prove that your service is as unto the Lord. N there's no more church you can go to to make your service unto the Lord. Okay? There's no more religious thing you can do to make your service as unto the Lord. Because service as unto the Lord is not going to come from activity. It's going to come from the purpose of the heart. And when you have the purpose to serve the Lord, it may increase your activity. But your activity will never create your heart. And so I have to know who I'm serving. I'm serving not myself. I'm serving not my master. I'm serving not even my father. I'm serving the Lord. And there has to be a constant reminder of that. A constant reminder of that. And it affects the way I obey. It affects the way I parent. It affects every relationship of my life. And so I have to constantly come back, who am I serving? Who am I serving? Now, it should be enough, to be honest, it should be enough for Christ to say, I am your master. I am your master in heaven. So all service, whether to parent or master or child or servant, all service should be unto me. Okay, He is worthy for it to him to be the one we serve. Okay, That should be enough for him to say, I am master, so therefore I need you with singleness of heart to proclaim and, and activate in purpose that your service would be unto me. That should be sufficient. But God is so gracious. Not only does he say that we should serve him because he is worthy, but he also says we should serve him because he reciprocates. 
Look what it says in verse uh, number six, or verse number six and number seven. Uh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as unto the Lord and not unto men. Though obviously men will be involved. It says, knowing that whatsoever good thing that any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Whatsoever good, the good thing that we do from the heart, okay, from the heart in service to God, though we be child or servant or master or father, when we do that good thing from the heart, for the service of the Lord, not to be men pleasers, but to be servants of Christ and to serve Him with our heart. And we do that obedient thing. We do that good thing. He says, when you do it, whatsoever. Don't you love the whatsoevers of the Bible? When God says, whosoever shall be saved, who does He mean? Whosoever. When God says, whatsoever good thing is done in this way, you'll receive it of the Lord again. Well, how many things is He talking about? He's talking about whatsoever of them. That we'll receive it. And you say, okay, well, hold on, preacher. I've, I've plugged in a lot of good things. Where, where's my receipt? Where, where, where am I going to get back? Well, probably you've gotten back more than you thought you have. Right, amen. Probably you have received far more good than you deserved. But best case scenario, you don't get it back until you see him. Amen. Laying up treasures. In heaven, as we talked about last week. And he takes that, those works that are try, tried by wood, uh, that wood, hay, and stubble, tried by fire. The wood, hay, and stubble burns up. And that which is done as unto the Lord is precious stones. And guess what? He gives those back to us. Ultimately, so we can glorify him again. But every single one of them. Every single one of them. That we do good as unto the Lord and not unto men with a single purpose of heart to please the Lord. Do you think the Lord can keep count? Of course he can. And he puts that in our hands and ability to do that. And he includes in, in this passage, in the practicality of it, the children, the father, the master, the servant. You say, maybe you think I'm over-exaggerating, but this is what I believe. That the child, this child knows Christ as their Savior and purposely obeys his parent in order with a heart to please God, God keeps count. God keeps count. Amen. And God is going to give that in receipt back. He may give it to you back in, on this, in this life. He may bless you and he may hold on to it. He may add it to your pile of works as you lay up your treasure in heaven. We think laying up treasure in heaven is accomplishing some great task of a missionary or some great task of a, of a preacher or some great task. No, no. Laying up treasure in heaven is doing any good thing as unto the Lord and not unto men Amen. with singleness of heart, being a servant of Christ. Amen. Being a servant of Christ. So it says, it says, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. It transcends your earthly circumstance. It transcends it. Oh man, if I, do you know what I could do for the Lord if I was rich? Actually, my name is Rich, so that doesn't qualify, but. <laughs> you know what I could do for the Lord if I was wealthy? If I, I mean, if I had a million dollars, do you know what I could do for the Lord? I could do good. And if I did it with singleness of heart, as a servant of Christ, he would take account of it and make receipt of it to me. But guess what? If I don't have two pennies to rub together, if I am... The most brunk, uh, the, the old preacher said, I'm so broke, I go to Kentucky Fried Chicken to lick other people's fingers. <laughs> That's how broke I am. <laughs> Some of the young people are like, what? I don't know what that is. <laughs> Even if you're that broke, 
I could never do anything for the Lord. I can't go. I'd love to buy the orphanage in Haiti. Wouldn't that be awesome if you could do that? Hey, friend, if you serve the Lord with singleness of heart and obey and do right and a perp with a singleness of heart to be a servant of Christ, every good deed that you do in service to Him, He makes account. He makes account. We are so much like children who think that the final, the accomplishment of life is always what we can do next. Do you remember before you graduated high school, you're like, once I graduate high school, life will begin. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, well, once I graduate college, life will begin. Once I get married, life will begin. Once I have children, life will begin. And another one, another one, another one, another one, another one, you know? <laughs> life will begin. Friend, I don't care if you're an eight-year-old boy in here. Life has begun. Life has begun. Live it with singleness of purpose to honor and glorify Christ and be a servant of Christ. And by God's grace in your environment, it's awesome when that environment is beneficial and helpful in that process. But even if it's not, you can serve Christ with your heart and he takes account. He takes account. He stores it up. He may bless you in this life. He may save it till it's tried by fire and turns it into precious stones and give it to you in the next life. I don't know which one's better. I want to be blessed. For, and I, 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 would, I love to be blessed. But I would also love to lay up some treasures in heaven. Yeah. Amen. But there has to be a purpose a singleness. And part of it comes down to what you deem to be important. My son walks into that room with the broom in his hand. Nothing within his brain goes, it's important that I clean this room very well. It's important. Oh man, I cannot live with myself if I don't sweep this room perfectly. <laughs> he doesn't think like that because he comes from his father. But his mother walks in and says, I'm going to clean this room. I'm going to clean this room. Why? There's purpose. There's purpose. We understand purpose. We understand singleness of purpose. We understand putting an importance on something that creates motivation. Putting an importance on something that creates burden. Putting an importance on something that even creates activity. And he says, I want you to do this. Whether you're a child, a servant, a master, a father... I want you to serve me with your heart. Every choice that you make, the declaration of faith or declaration of pride, I can serve the Lord. I can serve the Lord with a big choice. I can serve the Lord with a small choice. Amen. Oh, people will think if I put that much emphasis, people will think I'm strange. Listen, don't worry about what people think. Amen. <laughs> they probably already think you're strange. Okay? <laughs> But be purposeful. I would encourage you to do this. Probably the best way to, to um, communicate importance is with your mouth. Communicate it. Communicate it to yourself. Communicate it to your family. Communicate it uh, to your spouse that well, I want to do this to serve the Lord. I want to do this to honor the Lord. I do not want to do that because it will hinder my service to the Lord. I do not want to partake in that. It will hinder my service to the Lord. Hey friend, every time you fail to do something because you think, oh no, somebody might see me do it, you may not endure the consequences of that sin, but your heart is not serving the Lord. There has to be a purpose of heart. Whether you be child or servant, father or master. It says this, look what it says in verse number 9. And ye masters do the same thing unto men, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also in heaven, neither is there respect of any person. It doesn't matter. God is going to view service to him the same way. God's going to view those that are trying to please men or be elevated themselves the same way. I don't care 
who you are, where you come from, who your family is, it doesn't matter. If you have a heart to serve God, God sees it. And he says, I see that. I see that. I see that 14-year-old in difficult circumstances who wants to do this but wants to serve me and so chooses. I love Brother Mark reading that letter of that 14-year-old. Uh, and he serves God and serves God and serves God and says, Preacher, it's my 16th birthday. I need to get baptized today. Can you tell you that that's not something parents made him do or church forced him to do? He wanted to do it, clearly. Because it was in his heart. He says, I see it. It doesn't matter who you are. I see it. Then it says this, in verse number 11, verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. This is not simply a willpower act. Okay, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to serve the Lord. No, no. I need to have a purpose of my heart. God, I want to serve you with all my heart. But I still need His strength to be able to accomplish it. My dependency upon Him. My declaration of dependency that says, God, I need to serve you. I need to serve you. I was reading a letter from Omar. And... Uh, he was talking about not coming home for Christmas. Not being able to see family and friends and how hard that was. And he said this. He said, I remember Pastor Rossiter saying that thankfulness is not an emotion, but a declaration. It was amazing that right when I was reading that letter, I needed to have a declaration of thankfulness because I didn't feel thankful. I'm like, this is not fair. Omar using my own message to convict me. That's not even fair. But that's what it is, is I have to go back and say, dear God, this is what your word says. I don't, I, I don't feel like serving you. I feel like my masters are unfair. I feel like my father provokes me. I feel like my servants don't obey. I feel like my children don't obey. I have all these feelings. I go back and I state my purpose. Dear God, I want to serve you. I want to serve you with my heart. I don't know about five decisions from now, but I know about for this decision. Dear God, I want to serve you. And constantly go back. Say, preacher, if I do that, I'm going to be in a constant state of having to make sure that I'm serving for the right reason. Yeah. It's kind of what servants do. They operate at the pleasure of the master. They operate at the pleasure of the master. And they're constantly should be asking, what does the master want? What does the master want? And when a servant begins to think more highly of himself than he ought, that he begins to think he's the master, oh, his heart's out of place. I don't care how honored that you become, you're still a servant. And you can serve God with your heart. But most of us don't have the problem of being so great that we think, I am so awesome. You know what most of us struggle with? What can I do? I'm, I'm just a dad. I'm just a mom. I just work a job. The world doesn't know me. No fame has reached me. What can I do? You can serve with your heart or be a servant unto Christ with a single purposed heart to say the next decision. God, I'm going to do this for you. Amen. I'm going to obey for you. I'm going to honor for you. I'm going to do this unto your praise. Men may not understand it, but God never forgets it. Let's pray.